Hey everybody, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show. This is the show where we talk with major thought leaders from many fields of influence to show how worldview changes everything. My guest today used to be a member of the Communist Party in his early adulthood, but he had a huge change of heart, years of teaching as a journalism professor at a major university, and then became editor-in-chief of the Christian publication World Magazine, my favorite magazine, a position he's held for many, many years. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Marvin Olasky. Dr. Marvin Olasky, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. I am really glad to talk with you. Every time we have conversations, um, I, I learn something new, and I'm I'm so excited to say congratulations on 20 years as editor in chief of World Magazine. Right, actually, 29 years. 29. Um, right, right. So, yeah, one more to go. At which point I will continue writing, but step down from being editor. I have loved every minute of it. I. Uh, I think every single person who's watching this or listening to this, if you don't already subscribe to World Magazine, you want to go to worldmag.com. Is that the right? Worldmag.com. And right. you go ahead and, and sign up for it. Just trust me. If you don't have it, you need to get this magazine. It is my favorite magazine and has been during the whole time that I've known you. And the uh, it's, it's a remarkable way to take a biblical worldview and apply it to the issues of today and interesting and fascinating insights into people and into current events. So congratulations. Well, well thank you. Yes, um, I approve this message. <laughs> now, you wouldn't have back in the when you were younger that you are the editor in chief of the number one biblically worldview oriented magazine in the world would have been a big surprise to your younger self, wouldn't it? Well, I think so. Particularly uh, 50 years ago when I was a member of the Communist Party, that would have been <laughs> quite astonishing. <laughs> Tell us a little about that. What was it? You had a, you were a radical when you were young. Yeah. And these were these were the uh, the Vietnam War years. So I was involved in lots of demonstrations in Washington and New Haven, other places, and um, just kept moving to the left. I had become a, an atheist when I was 14. This is sadly traditional in, uh, in a lot of American Judaism right now, bar mitzvah 13, atheist of 14. And my atheism led me politically further and further to the left. What I learned at college uh, certainly contributed to that. So by the time I graduated in 1971, uh, I was a Marxist already and uh, bicycled across the country to Oregon, worked on a small newspaper there and uh, join, then joined the Communist Party. Um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just, I'm, I'm curious. We're hearing that up to 70% of millennials said they, they say they would vote for a socialist for president. I think the latest statistic I saw was that more than 50% of Americans say a political revolution may be necessary to redistribute wealth. A lot of people are drawn to that now. What drew it, you to it then? Well, along with the politics, probably a certain ruthlessness. In other words, people today, uh, uh, millennials and others who say, yeah, socialism, uh, they may be thinking about what passes, what's called democratic socialism. The idea that peacefully people will get together and decide to pull all their resources and everyone will live communally and happily ever after. It doesn't work out that way historically. It never has worked out the way historically because at a certain point, people become start becoming resentful about giving up if they've worked hard for something uh, and other people haven't. There's a certain resentment at just transferring resources. Um, and at that point, the revolutionaries have to decide, well, am I just going to give in to these natural tendencies to emphasize family and work for the benefit of my spouse and children and so forth, uh, am I going to just give into that or are we going to push harder to build a true egalitarian communalism? And at that point, usually the hardest, the most, the most ruthless people went out in the inter-party struggles. That's certainly what happened in the Soviet Union and China and so forth. So the toughest guys are the ones who say, democracy, forget about it. We're going to do what we have to do 
and that's going to involve putting people in prison. It's going to involve killing people. But hey, that's what we need to do in order to have a bright, wonderful, revolutionary society. And what does it matter if uh, a few hundred or a thousand or a million people get killed along the way? That's what happens in revolutions all the time. And folks who today just say, oh, I am for democratic socialism. Isn't this nice? Don't realize what they're getting into. The, so they, they start with the idea that we can have socialism by the ballot rather than the bullet. Right. But those right. with the bullets always end up running the show. Yeah, the most ruthless people went out in revolutionary situations because others want to be nice. They want to play nice. And when some people are nice and other people have guns and are willing to, to kill folks in the way, it's the people with guns who win. So you got in inter, you got involved in communism because you thought this is the this is the way to peace this is the way to to fight the military industrial complex and things like that uh, but, but at some point along the way you had a revelation that this is n not going the direction that you thought it would can you tell us a little about that yeah well I remember uh, weirdly writing in a notebook at that time uh, yes. Uh, this revolutionary stuff we're talking about is sin, but it's sin going somewhere. Mm. That is, you know, life is full of sin, but this is sin that would actually be progress. Wow. So I thought that was useful. But now where did this concept of sin come from? Uh, you know, maybe from my childhood, but I think I pretty much left that behind for about 10 years. Um, November 1st, 1973, I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan. And then for some reason, which I still can't explain, uh, because I was pretty happy as a communist, I saw lots of things, lots of things going wrong in the United States, Watergate and all that, which meant lots of things going right for communism. I thought this was the wave of the future. But for some reason that day, I was in my room just off the University of Michigan campus. Um, and I sat in, a, in my chair for eight hours, just thinking, well, is there really a God and if so, what does that mean as far as my own personal life? What does that mean as far as politics? So three o'clock in the afternoon, I sat down. I was a communist. I had been reading a pamphlet by Lenin called Socialism and Religion. It wasn't anything new to me. He said that atheism is the foundation of communism. Yeah. I read that, but I started to think, well, what if I'm wrong in being an atheist? What if there really is a God? And after eight hours, uh, and I wasn't doing any drugs or anything like that. I was looking over the clock and just surprised I was still sitting and just thinking these thoughts coming into my head, there really is a God of some sort. Um, got up, wandered around the uh, University of Michigan campus, cold, dark for a couple of hours. And at the at one o'clock in the morning, I realized, hey, I believe in a God of some sort. Therefore, I'm no longer a communist. Therefore, I should leave the Communist Party. Wow. And what did you leave to go to? Did you have any idea at that point? No, at that point, uh, I left because I just thought this wasn't right and there was a God of some sort. What kind of God, I had no idea. And after three weeks of wondering and starting to read things by people who were no longer communist, uh, hey, I had to get back to writing my term papers uh, and tried to put the stuff out of my mind. And here's where God and his mysterious providence intervened. Um, 1974, uh, I was to, to get a PhD, I had to get a have a reading knowledge of a foreign language. The language I had been learning was Russian. I had forgotten my high school French and all that and just had a book in my bookshelf that I had picked up a couple of years before when I was a reporter in Oregon. It had been given to me. I had held on to as kind of a weird souvenir of my Oregon life. It was a copy of the New Testament in Russian that people in a Russian speaking commune in the Willamette Valley had passed on to me and started reading just for reading practice. And, um, you know, I may be the only person reading Matthew who really likes the chapter with all the begats, so-and-so begat so-and-so, because I could get through it pretty quickly. I knew the Russian word for having children. Um, but I kept reading, plunging on. And by the time I got to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters five and six, I thought, wow, this is something really special. It's not man-made because Jesus's whole concept of turning the other cheek was totally foreign to me as a communist. Basically, if if someone hits you on the cheek when you're a communist, you're supposed to cut off his head. Basically, um, you want to someone is acts harshly towards you. You want to be doubly harsh to him. But Jesus 
speaking about love and compassion and so forth, I thought, wow, this is really special. So that led me part of the way towards becoming a Christian. I had I had grown up in a Jewish household thinking that Christians are kind of stupid people who worship Christmas trees. Mm. But in the fall of 1974, when I was assigned, not volunteered, assigned to teach a course on early American literature. Well, what's early American literature? It's basically Puritan sermons. So all these dead white males from 300 years ago were preaching to me. And I realized these are not stupid people. You can hate the Puritans, you can love the Puritans, but anyone who reads them thinks these are people who work this out very carefully, very rationally, step by step. So I came away from that also heading towards Christianity. Um, there are other twists and turns along the path, but three years after finally deciding, realizing there's a God of some kind, I was ready to actually say, this is Christ, this is God, and professed faith in Christ, joined the church, and that was in 1976. So 45 years later, here I am, uh, believing more and more in Christ and really reading the Bible and realizing this is actually very, very wise stuff. Wow. I get chills when I hear your story because it is such a powerful demonstration of God's spirit working in a person that you were reading yeah. the New Testament in Russian as a graduate student yeah. and encountered and, Jesus. Yeah, and this is this is God. Um, my own path was towards more sin, sin that I thought was useful, but full of sin personally, politically, um, but God had other plans. So yeah, I, I, I hear lo lots of people come to Christ in lots of different ways, sometimes it's sudden, sometimes it takes longer, but uh, yeah, it also sends chills running up and down my spine because it's God. It's a story of what God's doing. It's not that we are wise. Our natural tendency is towards sin and towards basically being pretty stupid. But at some point, sometimes sooner, sometimes later, we realize God's a lot smarter than us. Wow. When we first met, you were a professor at the University of Texas mm -hmm. at Austin. And, right. And one of the things when I was a professor, I, people would always say to me, hey, you know, I'm sorry that you're a teacher. Those who cannot do teach you. Uh -huh. You've always done both things. You have always t taught journalism to students, but you have been a journalist working and, and writing and editing all during that time. And, and I'm, I'm curious a little bit about how you got interested in journalism, because I think this is all going to tie together. We're, we're going to talk about a new book that you have written it's so timely and so significant, but I'd really love to just talk about journalism for a minute. Well, um, worked in my high school newspaper and I discovered the thrills of a press pass. Namely, when there was a fire in the high school, I showed my press pass and the fire fighters let me go behind them and look around at the burned stuff and so forth, which other kids in high school couldn't do. I thought, wow, this is lots of fun. Um, then I went to work I, at college. I, I became a reporter on the Yale Daily News. I wrote a column, enjoyed going around New Haven, Connecticut and going into poor areas of the, of the, of the city, uh, going into places where Orton and I wouldn't go. And I thought, hey, this is lots of fun to be able to do this and see things I otherwise wouldn't say. Um, worked in a small newspaper in Oregon, uh, enjoyed when the, uh, when the county commission had uh, a new car I, and, and it was a little fancier than the average uh, resident of Bend, Oregon had, and they didn't want me to see it and take photos of it. I enjoyed being able to get the specifications from the car dealer and take a photo of the garage door and say, behind this locked door is this car. <laughs> so yeah, it was things like that. That just seemed lots of fun. Um, um, I, there's, there's more to the story, but skipping by, it just always seemed interesting to me. When writing my dissertation and I had become uh, a conservative and uh, was writing things that the very liberal chairman of my dissertation committee didn't like, um, so he actually resigned about a month before the dissertation defense. He did what wow. was very unethical in academia and resigned as chairman just because he didn't like the politics of it. But happily, there was another fellow, the one Christian in the history department of 38 history professors at the University of Michigan, 
the one Christian who saw what this fellow, this other professor was doing to me and came on as my chairman. And so I managed to get my PhD, but he wrote a recommendation that wasn't really going to help me get an academic job, although it turned out I was able to get one, but saying that basically I'm not an academic. I'm more of a journalist. Hmm. Hmm. And he saw that in me and he was right. So, you know, becoming a professor, I also had the opportunity to write some columns and freelance for magazines and so forth. And then eventually got involved with the world. And through the kindness of Texas taxpayers at that time, I was able to get a full-time salary for teaching six hours a week and able to devote most of my time to world. Uh, so thank, thank God for Texas taxpayers who don't exactly know what's going on at the university and we're actually subsidizing world at that point. Well, now uh, they do. Yeah. And some of them are going to be grateful. <laughs> well, yeah, some of, some of them are, most of them are probably resentful, but, uh, but yeah, that was, it was always a lot of fun being a journalist. It turned out that, since my lifetime batting average in Little League was about 182. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't able to do a lot of other things. I found that I was able pretty well to do some writing. And then I actually turned out to be a pretty decent editor. And so, uh, yeah, 29 years later, editing world, uh, I've, en I've enjoyed not every moment, but most moments of it. And I still enjoy writing a lot. And, uh, yeah, I would advocate journalism because, and this is what we tell world readers, you know, we're going to we're going to introduce you to people you probably don't know and would never meet. We're going to take you to places you probably would never visit. Maybe sometimes we're going to suggest ideas to you that you probably haven't had or might not have. So, yeah, journalism has always been enormous fun. Um, well, I have loved it. I've, I, I, I love the format of the magazine and the way it's it's so accessible and the way it does bring up ideas. But you you have a different idea of journalism than is is seems to be common today that, that from from even from when even back before you were a Christian you saw journalism as a way to reveal the truth whereas and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here but it seems like a lot of journalism today is designed to construct a truth or to construct a mm -hmm. narrative and then yeah. pick stories that fit that narrative and diminished stories that don't. Is that too harsh of a thing to say? No, that's a fine thing to say. And that's accurate that uh, a lot of journalists are, they're not members of the Communist Party, but their thinking has been powerfully influenced by Marxism. Um, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, the concept is a very good concept, but the organization itself is essentially a neo-Marxist organization. I mean, neo-Marxist because it puts race in place of class and all mm -hmm. that type of stuff, which I'm sure some administries, students learn a lot about, they do. which is which is really good to know, to know how that works. Um, so all that stuff is out there, but it's an ideology. An, I an ideology is something constructed by human beings. And therefore it's not objective, it's subjective. It may be some ideologies are truer than other ideologies, but nothing is real. But none of them is really objective as far as explaining the world the way it really is, because the only one who knows objectively the way the world is, is the person who made it. And that's God. And the Bible tells us objectively how the world is. And so a world, we have our philosophy of biblical objectivity, which is unusual. I mean, highly unusual in American journalism, which is very subjective sometimes pretending to be objective in terms of ideology, but it's subjective, or sometimes saying, there's no way ever we can know what's true. And so I'm going to quote from person X and person Y and person Z, I'm going to quote all their subjectivities, and that's going to lead to an objective story. Well, that's not the way it works. It's still not objective. Um, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you from my house um, in Austin, Texas, and the fellow who built the house used to live next door to us. And so when I had a question about the house, I was able to actually ask the builder and get an objective analysis. He knew the way the house is made because he had built it. When we want to find out the way the world, which is a house built by God, is constructed, we go to the Bible because that's where the builder tells us how he constructed the house. So that's basically biblical objectivity. That's what we learn. That's what we try to put into practice. And if there are students who are watching this or listening to this right now, 
there is a way for them to study with you and your colleagues to learn the principles of biblical objectivity, learn to be excellent journalists through the World Journalism Institute. Can you just mention something about that? Because even if it's just five or 10 or 20 students who are interested in this kind of thing, I would want them to know about it. Well, sure. Um, If they're in their sophomore year in college, they've just finished their sophomore year in college, uh, or more typically just finished their junior year in college, they're eligible to apply to the World Journalism Institute College Program, which is two weeks. Uh, we've done it, we did it by Zoom last year. This year, we just we just did it in, at Dort University in, mm. in beautiful Northwest Iowa. Um, two weeks, really intensive, working from nine in the morning, usually to midnight, learning about writing uh, on paper or for the website, but also uh, broadcasting for podcast and and now we have uh, a program World Watch, which is for students, ten minutes daily, uh, a TV show, and so also learning how to do that. And we typically have about twenty six students a year, the second half of May, um, and we offer then internships to some of them, and then others go and work for. Christian ministries or secular organizations. So, uh, no, it is a, uh, it is the students tell us regularly, it's the hardest two weeks they've ever had in a, in an academic program, but also those who are journalism majors typically say they've, they've learned more in two weeks in the program than they learned in their journalism courses being majors in their colleges, because it's just really intense. But the students form really strong bonds with each other. And we have, uh, I think, a teacher-student ratio this past year of about 1 to 2.5. So lots of world people involved. It's really hands-on. And uh, yeah, we professors, I can say, really enjoy it. And and the students, actually, working very hard, we get, we get their reports and appraisals, and they enjoy it, too. And then they often want to get together for alumni uh, mm. uh, uh relations and uh, they they develop lots of friends who sometimes become friends for the next 10 years. Mm. Well, any of the students who've been to a Summit Ministries two-week program who are interested in journalism could could really benefit from that. And, and, yeah, the- and, I'll, I'll, and I'll say also that if they are not at that august time in life, that is having finished their sophomore year in college, uh, they can still learn a little uh, here's here's my commercial. Uh, I wrote a book called uh, that came out a couple of years ago called Reforming Journalism, which basically we use as as the text at the World Journalism Institute. But it's something that that a high school student uh, can regularly can can readily read, understand, and maybe even enjoy because I try to do some storytelling in it. So, yeah, I'd recommend that to people who have not reached the age of 20 years old or so, but are are smart and interested enough uh, reforming journalism. I would recommend that as well. I thought that was a terrific book. Yeah. Thanks. This, uh, in the, in the, I just wanted to f- follow up with one thought on, on World Journalism Institute. Your graduates have gone on to do some really extraordinary things. This isn't just a program that's an interesting thing for Christians to do. This is helping Christians move into the marketplace of ideas. Yeah, we we have a lot of students working at secular papers, including uh, Washington Post and uh, 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 Gannett uh, papers all over the country and so forth. So big papers, little papers. Um, yeah, we're we're happy to see that because because uh, often it's it's hard. Often that person may be the only Christian in the newsroom. But one thing I think I found out that if 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 a person is a good writer. There aren't a whole lot of good writers to go around in America anymore, and people who are good writers do not starve. Mm. Uh, you know, may be hard at times, may have to uh, fight with editors at times uh, if they want to do want to do an honest job. But no, they can survive and uh, and really enjoy being being God's servant in uh, in a different situation. It's uh, it's uh, newsroom evangelism, which is really important. Wow. Well, you, you've written a number of books in addition to editing the publication that comes out uh, every other week for 29 years. And, 
I don't know how you find the time to write, but I think you've, you're in a season of life where you've begun to really reflect back on your younger years. And, and this is a very personal uh, thing that you're, you're thinking about and writing about now in this, this new book called Lament for a Father, about the complex relationship you had with your dad. And I was thinking this through when you were talking about coming to believe in God and, and God is our father. Uh, could, could you tell a little bit about your story that you're writing about here? I know that we want to make a difference in the world. We are living in families and a lot of people who are watching or listening right now have difficult relationships in their families and we want to, we want to learn. Yeah. Um, no, I had a, a difficult relationship in some ways in that, uh, uh, my father grew up uh, in an Orthodox Jewish household, but um, and was very ambitious. Uh, and and the book goes into the way he worked so hard to get into Harvard from a high school that was not a feeder school for Harvard, but uh, he had to take an extra year uh, of of schooling after graduating from high school. He he went to a feeder school with the goal of applying to Harvard again. He was turned down the first time. So very ambitious. And in college, he basically has to decide, am I going to stick with uh, my my father's religion, that is my grandfather's religion, which was Orthodox Judaism, which has God creating Adam and Eve and the whole world yeah. and everything? Or uh, since I'm majoring in anthropology, am I going to be a success in anthropology by moving to the worldview of these very distinguished anthropology professors, which is basically straight Darwinistic evolutionary materialism. He had to make that choice, or he felt he had to make that choice because he was hoping to go to graduate school in anthropology and become a professor. Uh, he made the choice. He chose for Harvard over Judaism. Hmm. And he still retained an affection for Jewish culture, but theologically, um, he looked at the Bible. I, I read. I finally got my hands on his senior thesis uh, and that he that he did at Harvard, and oh, wow. he basically says the the Bible is just another document from the ancient New Year, Near East. There's nothing God about it. It's just something people wrote, like Babylonian documents or this or that. So that was throwing over what he had what he had learned, uh, and and that that I think looking back now is sad. So. I, he went through a lot of other changes, and uh, he had he had uh, uh, I think sad experiences after after he threw over his whole belief system to get into the anthropology program at Harvard for several reasons that are complicated. Uh, the program kicked him out after his first year, so he had sacrificed everything to go there, and mm -hmm. and uh, the love was not uh, was not reciprocated by Harvard at that point. He fought. He went into World War II uh, right after the war. Uh, he had a fluent knowledge of German, and so, um, as best I can tell, with about 95 percent certainty, because he'd never talk about this. But right after the war, he was dispatched to be a translator, interpreter to the concentration camps and refugees. Wow. And he saw what the Nazis had done. He saw the dead bodies stacked up, um, and that also changed his life. Um, so he went through a long career. But then when I came to believe in God and then and then specifically became a Christian, even though he didn't believe in God, this was this was joining the enemy mm -hmm. because I think he associated as, as many as many Jews do. He associated, well, Christians with anti-Semitism and he had seen the results of anti-Semitism, the dead bodies in concentration camps. And so why was I going over to the enemy? So this was hard. We had had. We'd had a distant relationship already because uh, um, he was a very introspective person. I was very selfish and self-absorbed. Uh, but once I became a Christian, I think things became became harder. So he never really answered my questions, and I was not persistent as I should have been in asking questions, but he never really answered quite my questions. So I had to, after his death at age 67 from cancer in 1984, I slowly became more and more interested in what he had gone through, and I had to do a lot of detective work. I had to interview 10 of my cousins to find out what 
memories they had of him and of my grandparents. Um, I was able to talk with my with my mother for many more years until she died in 2008. But I found out once I started doing research, once the Harvard people, after I pushed hard, gave me some of his records, once I talked with others, I found out that she actually did not understand a lot of things either about him. I think he had kept some of these things from him, from, from her. And um, I was able, I think, to find out what actually went on and to develop a certain gratitude to him for not telling me all these things. Mm -hmm. I don't know if if some of the listeners here have seen detective shows, police shows, one of the common things is the police officers, the detectives don't go home and tell their wives and kids what they've seen on their job. And that's actually a merciful yeah. thing for them to do. It's very hard on them keeping all this within themselves. And that's what my father did. He kept in within himself some things he had seen, but I think he, this was a very altruistic thing on his part. He did it for the benefit of his wife and children. In my case, if he had told me, if he had told me all the concentration camp stories and identify that with anti-Semitism uh, and said Christians are anti-Semitic, I would have come up, come up, uh, uh, become older believing that. And that probably would have inhibited me as I moved towards Christianity. So I'm very grateful, in fact, that you didn't tell me that, which, which wasn't true. The real Christians, the true Christians <coughs> in Germany fought, <coughs> fought against Hitler. Um, and you know, true Christianity is 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 best friend, uh, you know, kissing cousin to true Judaism. Yeah. Um, but uh, I would not have believed that. Uh, so I'm grateful to my father in that way for keeping a lot of this within himself. I wish he had talked more, but I can understand now why he did it, and I can honor that and and love him for doing that. That is a powerful uh, thing, Marvin. I know as a dad. And, and I've had a lot of difficult family struggles. I've talked about this uh, publicly a lot, wrote about it in the, the, a book called The Secret Battle of Ideas About God. Mm -hmm. But as a dad, <clears throat> I constantly struggle with how to help my children prepare for life in a difficult world. But also that mercy that you're describing of, yeah. of um, doing that in a, keeping in mind their capacity to grasp things and what it means when I just lay things on them. Yeah, my, my father's favorite saying was, uh, expect the worst so you won't be disappointed. Hmm. Uh, and that's really after a certain point when, when after Harvard kicked him out, after he saw what the Nazis has done, had done, after he had an unhappy marriage, that nevertheless he stuck with. And, and I think I think I'm much better off because he did than if they'd gotten a divorce, you know, after all these blows to his to his self-esteem and to his sense of things, I think he really internalized that he did expect the worst. So he wouldn't be disappointed. But you don't want to have a child grow up that way. Um, I don't think for for whatever reason, I, I tend to be more of an optimist than a pessimist. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I am. Uh, I want my children to be optimistic. I think as, as Christians, we can be optimistic because we know there's a big, hard struggle along the way, but eventually there's a happy ending, uh, both individually for us and then for the whole, for the whole world. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want, we don't want our kids to expect the worst. We, we, we want to instill a sense of, of optimism in them and, uh, yeah, that means sometimes we we withhold from them some of the realities of things until they're old enough to to understand it themselves and realize that uh, yeah, bad things happen, but that's not the end of the story. I think I'm seeing biblical objectivity, as you described it, in a new light based on what you just said. Because when I read World Magazine, as opposed to other magazines that I read, other uh, I, there's only one other news magazine that I regularly read. There's always, a, there is a current of hope that runs through everything because God is there, because God is a creator and a loving father. We have hope even in the midst of difficult things. Yeah, I think that's true. And we ask our reporters, uh, number one, go out and, and report. Uh, we try to do things that write stories at street level, not sweet level, as we say. Mm. It's a lot easier these days, by the way, just to 
to throw out your opinions, but to actually do reporting is, is hard, which is why a lot of people don't do it. But we, we emphasize that, and this means reporting bad news very often, but we always ask, and reporters are conscious of this, is there a redemptive thread? And very often there is. Uh, sometimes it just looks bleak and we just report that, uh, but other times, yeah, there's, there's bad news we report, but nevertheless, you see people, particularly Christians, but others as well, um, soldiering on, uh, bringing, bringing uh, heart into a situation that may just seem cold and ruthless, and, and showing the way that Christ changed his lives as he, as he, as he changed our lives. So, no, that's very rewarding to, uh, I think our, our reporters are realists, but they're also to a certain extent, uh, romantic realist and the romance is true mm -hmm. because Christ loves the church and we can report what God does in the world through common grace, through special grace to begin restoring things and, and bring people to himself. And yet they also have to be able to discern the, the narratives that are out there, the stories that are being told that are untrue. It's, it's almost like there, there needs to be a, a doubt, a streak of doubt in the mind of a reporter to, to somehow hear what's going on behind the story that they're being fed in order to get to the real story. How do you, how do you balance that with hope? Well, um, you know, and, and I think your students learn that, that critical thinking at colleges is often a euphemism for Marxist or neo-Marxist thinking. But I, I taught for a couple of years a big um, lecture class at the University of Texas called Critical, critical Thinking for Journalists. And uh, I actually meant critical in the, way, in the way the word is defined in the dictionary. Uh, namely, you, you, you think hard about stuff uh, you don't go in just um, thinking that everything is nice. You you ask hard questions. You criticize authorities, uh, which people on the left like when it's criticizing conservative authorities, but not but not progressive authorities. But yeah, everyone, everyone uh, is to some extent, and this includes Christians. Everyone is telling a story of some kind, some more true than others. And you want to probe that and ask, how do you know this is true? Um, in fact, uh, you know, there's there's a fellow who who told me the the four hard questions at uh, <laughs> at some point, uh, and and we 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 have to we I pass that that on to our students, um, and you want to ask those questions, so you can ask those questions, and be critical, but again, we have the basic understanding that there is reality in the world, there's objective reality in the world, and that reality is God uh, and the world God has created. And that in some ways we here on this earth are in the arena and, you know, it's, uh, or, or we're, on a, we're on a stage that's broken in some ways and there are people who are watching. There are fans in the stands and um, that's important. You know, in Texas, the, there's a song, you know, the eyes of Texas are upon you which has, I think, a certain theological significance. I'm not sure that you, that's the way it's, it's <laughs> often sung, especially when people have had a couple of beers. But, you know, the eyes of God are upon us, and yeah. the angels are in the stands, and we learn the Bible that they're watching, and that's pretty exciting that, that uh, we, are, we, are, uh, we are athletes out there, as, as Paul said, and we run the race. So it's exciting to be in that. It's also hard exhausting at times, but there's there's excitement in running the race. So that's partly the redemptive thread and also knowing that God is in charge. You know, another one of our of our little sayings, I mean, that I try to have our reporters and our and our readers understand is that uh, the sky isn't falling because God is holding up the sky. Mm -hmm. So we can have that faith that even when things look bad, there's a plot here, there's a story, there's a script that God is, has written and uh, at the end, there's a happy ending. Yeah, that we can be curious without having yeah. to be cynical. Yeah, we yeah. are very curious because uh, we don't know from moment to moment what's happening. I mean, God knows this is all part of God's plan, but we are learning all the time and, and, and watching sometimes, sometimes with jubilation, sometimes with frustration. But 
yeah, it's all it's all part of a story, and we're we are little hobbits in a great big world, but we have our we have our task, and it's pretty exciting. Marvin, as we draw our conversation to a close, uh, I want to. I'm thinking about uh, my relationship with my father, uh, which was strained when I was in college, and we reconciled, and and it's been great since. But I'm wondering if you would just. Uh, just give us a little bit of insight of what you learned as you were writing Lament for the Father about those who are watching or listening right now who have a difficult relationship with the parent. Is there any wisdom that, that you could give to them, any way that we can take the hope that we've been talking about and help apply it to their personal situation? Well, let me start with one, with one thing I learned about myself. That I, that I was already learning over the years, but it, it, it came to me more, more emphatically about how self-centered I was uh, as a teenager in my 20s, even in, into my 30s. Um, when I was growing up, I basically saw my parents as my servants to a certain extent. Mm. You know, I expected them to do stuff for me. I had... I had um, I looked at them in that way, that their that their their task in life, and this is putting it a little a little crassly and roughly, uh, and I suspect the listeners are are better people than I was, but I basically I basically didn't think of them as human beings with their own with their own joys and frustrations and problems and all that. I basically saw them in relation to me, and. Yeah. You know that that in part is being young and so forth. So, but I I look back and I wish I had done better. I wish I had thought of them as as human beings with some needs of their own rather than just functioning to to meet my needs. So, I think looking back, if I had had that awareness then that I have now, I would have been a much better son to them. And that may be something that some of the sons and daughters who are out there listening uh, can apply to themselves. Uh, Secondly, I, I learned, uh, again, and, and I think you have to have that, that self-insight first, but I really came to realize the importance of asking questions. I wish I had asked more questions. Uh, I wish certainly as I was, I was older and they were older still, but still alive, I wish I'd asked them to, to tell me or at least write down more about their own backgrounds and where they came from and what their parents were like and their grandparents, if they knew anything about them and so forth. So. I wish I had I'd asked them, oh, please, you know, write some of this stuff down or tell me about it, because at some point later on, I'm going to want to know it. And it's going to be harder yeah. to find out at that point. Um, a third thing is, yeah, even if even if you're older or if your parents have died or they're no longer in contact, there is still a lot of research you can do, especially with the Internet now. I mean, I was able to find out um, you know, what kind of music they were probably listening to, okay. what the news events were, how things that affected their lives, how this and this and this. So even if you can't talk with them directly, uh, you can interview other people, but even just going on the internet, finding out how they got from one place to another, if they had to travel to school, how they had to travel, if they had to go a long distance at some point, how they did, you can find out all that stuff now. You can research and it's really interesting detective work to do. So that would be a recommendation also to, uh, to folks. Uh, but I think it starts with the self-insight that you have to be really be interested in them and thinking of them as real human beings. And, and then also, I think as parents, we realize, hey, as parents, we normally, we know, we know what our parents did wrong. And we are going to work hard to correct that. And, you know, if there were three things we really wished our parents would, would have done with us, we're going to do them with our children. But of course, what we won't be aware of are the three other things that we could do. And maybe our children aren't telling us they'd really like, maybe they are, but we don't. In other words, um, we will make what, whatever we, whatever flaws we see in our own parents, I think we can be pretty sure that our children will see rightly those flaws in us. And we can do we can repair some of those things. We can do better in some ways, but we'll probably also do worse in some ways. Um, so I would say also from the point of view of parents, um, you know, try as best you can to have a really good 
honest relationship with your kids so that you can be frank with them within the limitations of what they can understand in different ages and you hope they will be frank with you. Mm -hmm. So if you can convey to them, don't worry about hurting my feelings. I would really like to know what what you would really want me to do. Um, and some kids will say that and that's very useful. It's very useful to know. Not that not that we'll be able to, to satisfy in every way, but perhaps we'll be able to satisfy in some ways that we otherwise would not. But yeah, yeah communication and really pushing that hard and uh, from from both ends as much as possible, I think is is really important. I see that uh, being so helpful personally. But if you extend that as your mission to the world, those same principles apply. Uh, Marvin, thank you for sharing your wisdom today. Thank you for sharing your story with us. It's been a fantastic uh, journey with you in the last little bit. And uh, I'm really grateful that you came on the show today. Well, thanks, Jeff. And, and no, congratulations on the on summit success. And, uh, you know, I, I do pray that you'll be able to climb even higher mountains. It has been so great to have Dr. Marvin Olasky from World Magazine on this show. Follow him at worldmag.com. Go ahead and subscribe if you don't have that publication already. You can also follow him on Twitter at Marvin Olasky. There is a lot of fake news out there. There's a lot of twisted information out there. It is so important to do journalism well or anything that God calls us to do and to do it with integrity. So go forward, be the one to stand, be courageous in Jesus name. We'll see you next week. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Dobson from the Rebel Parenting Podcast. When my parents, Jim and Shirley Dobson, sent me to the Summit Ministries Worldview Conference when I was 17, we had no idea the impact it would have on my life. It changed me so much in two short weeks, I've returned every summer for 34 years. This summer, your student can attend an in-person conference. That's right, in person. Summit Ministries Worldview Conference challenges students ages 16 to 24 to think deeper about their convictions and their faith by engaging with today's top worldview thinkers and apologists. Can you imagine in person with other students learning about the Christian worldview? If not, they can attend Summit's virtual experience and it's amazing. Change your student's life forever by partnering with Summit Ministries Worldview Conference today. Find out more by clicking the link in the show notes.